Okay, so I titled it Becoming a Scientist and Detecting the Cause of a Recent Epidemic. So this simulation is going to give you a couple of missions and one of those missions is to find out what's causing people to have kidney disease. There seems to be a sudden epidemic of kidney disease. Um, and so they're going to have you um, design an experiment to test that. Um, so in this simulation, you will learn what the scientific method is, how to apply it, what is a hypothesis, what is an experiment, what's a model organism, experimental variables, right? So what's a control variable, what's a negative control variable, what's a independent and dependent variable, right? Um, then we're going to talk about fluorescent microscopy and fluorescent cell death assay. Um, and then uh, kidney, the, the kidney disease, okay? So this is, this is the order in which it should appear when you do your simulation. Uh, the order that I talk about it might be a little different. Okay, so um, the scientific method, as I'm sure you're very familiar with from previous classes, um, is a continuous process where we, uh, we make observations and we ask questions about those and then we try to answer those questions by doing some background research to see, okay, what does the scientific community already know about this topic, about this question that I have. Um, and if we don't feel certain with uh, an answer, uh, like we wanna contribute more information on that topic, then we might construct a hypothesis so that we can conduct experiments to answer that question. And I know that um, this lobster simulation is going to say prove or disprove. And really, we don't use that language in science. I have yet to ever read a scientific article, uh, published journal that says prove or disprove. Really, we use the language support or not support. Um, so try to, to do that. But I know uh, since you're going to see it in the lobster, it might be a difficult habit to break. Um, okay, so the scientific method consists of techniques to investigate phenomena. Uh, to acquire new knowledge or correct um, previous knowledge. So sometimes we, we gather information and we didn't have the best tools available. Uh, we didn't have as much other knowledge. And so we might have come to some incorrect understanding of it. Um, or yeah, there can be lots of reasons why we need to continue to correct and expound upon knowledge. So when you do that background research, you don't just take the first answer that you find, but you look for, is there a lot of different experiments that have come to the same conclusion? Um, and if there are, if there is a large body of support, then you would probably not continue to do more research on that, but you would pick something else, okay. Um, let's see, oh, okay, so in this flow diagram, uh, it's not necessarily always done in this particular order, and you don't necessarily see every single box utilized, but this is a general um, overview of what the scientific method looks like, okay. And you should see this same diagram when you look at the theory tab on, um, on Lapster. Okay, so a hypothesis has to be constructed so that you can test it, okay? And it should be trying to give an explanation to the question that you posed. So you made some observation and asked a question and now you're proposing an explanation or an answer to that question. And so it should read similar to if then statements, right? It should lead you to make a prediction that can be tested. Okay, so a hypothesis must be testable. It should be an uh, if then statement. And interestingly, this if then statement, if X then Y, 
it also means that the X would stand for your independent variable and your Y would stand for your dependent variable. So the independent variable, if you uh, forgot, is the variable that you, the experimenter, can change. And then you want to see what that change does to your dependent variable. So you don't change the dependent variable, but you measure it and observe it to see if it has been changed by the independent variable. Okay. And so if we look at plant growth as our um, something we have a question about, right? So uh, maybe we ask ourselves, I wonder if water is the best um, liquid to use uh, for growing plants. And you might decide to test soda and orange juice and water and compare and see if there are any differences in growth. So your controlled variable would be water and your dependent variable would be the uh, height or the uh, width of the plant, um, how many leaves it has, does it um, produce as much fruit, is that fruit as um, big, etc. right? So the independent variable would be the, uh, like the soda, right? And then the, um, the dependent variable would be the plant. And I know that this looks confusing because it's showing this picture of juice and then it has this arrow that says dependent variable. Please note that it's showing the ruler as being the dependent variable. So the growth of the plant is the dependent variable, not this orange juice. Okay. So I typed up a couple of example hypotheses for you to look at to feel more comfortable with. You certainly could create more than just these two, um, but I just kind of picked what seemed easy and, and obvious to me. So um, let's say we think the orange juice will be the best liquid to grow. And let's say the plants we're using are specifically tomato plants. Okay, so hypothesis number one, if the orange juice helps the growth of tomato plants, then I expect to see an increase in one or more of the following plant height, number or size of leaves, number or size of tomatoes, right? And so you can see here in this hypothesis, you can see the independent and dependent variables. You can see my prediction and we can easily test this, okay? Um, example hypothesis number two, if soda is harmful to tomato plants, then I expect to see fewer or smaller tomatoes grow when watered only with soda. Um, I could even add in there, I expect, expect the plant to die, okay? Um, one thing I didn't put in these hypotheses is the amount of time and how frequently I would take these measurements. So in the background research, you would need to know, well, what is the typical amount of time that it takes tomato plants to grow and produce uh, tomatoes? What time of the year would be appropriate? How much sunlight, right? And you would need to control all of those variables so that they stay constant um, while you run this experiment. Okay, so an experiment, a proper experiment, should be reproducible, meaning that you have enough details and enough parameters that anybody could perform that experiment and they should obtain the similar results that you obtained, okay? Um, and your results should be reliable. So when you repeat the experiment yourself, do you get consistent results? Or did you have one plant that grew a lot when watered with water and one plant that grew very little when you watered it with water? That would be inconsistent and that would tell you that um, one of your parameters must not have been held constant, something went wrong, okay? Um, so when I did research, of course I was working with, uh, for different research projects, I worked with either bacteria or cells that were eukaryotic cells and um, virus, 
Okay, so for me, I was able to do a lot of things like in Petri plates, and I would do them in what we call triplicate, meaning that for one experiment, I would have three plates that would be my test plates, three plates that would be my positive control, and three plates that would be my negative control. Um, and then I would repeat that whole experiment two more times. And that would ensure that my results were reliable and um, reproducible. Okay, um, having well-designed parameters or variables is very important. If you don't specify the amount of time, the intervals that you take your measurements, how you take your measurements, all of these things, uh, then it won't be reproducible. So having well-defined and well-designed variables, um, again, also making sure they're appropriate, right? If I try to grow tomato plants in the winter outside, that would not be an appropriate ex experiment, right? Um, and of course, you always need to have positive and negative control so that you know, um, and especially when you're looking at um, like Petri plates, this is especially important. If you don't have a positive control, then you don't know how to judge your test results, whether they're positive or not, right? Same thing with a negative. If you don't have a negative control, you don't know if your experiment was contaminated, if it's valid. Um, and so you should always be able to know what your positive and your negative results look like, and then measure your results against those positive and negative controls. Okay, um, model organisms are really important. You cannot go around testing human beings, right, whenever you want uh, to limit the exposure um, and the tests that are done on humans and other large animals. We use model organisms. There are lots of model organisms. A few examples include E. coli, which is a bacteria, um, Eukaryotic cells include fungi, so yeast is used a lot. Uh, yeast are single cells, but they are eukaryotic, so they have a more complexity than a bacterial cell. And, and because of that, they're going to be more similar to human cells. Uh, C. elegans are going to be even more similar to humans as they are a type of animal. They are a roundworm. Um, fruit fly, same thing goes for that. Um, a flowering plant, which is right here to the right, Aerodopidus, uh, is also a common uh, model used. Now, when it comes to the plants, we don't usually use plants when we're trying to learn about um, human uh, diseases or things, but it is a model organism that's used to represent other plants. Um, and then we have uh, mice. Uh, when we have to, we, we can use mice. And then once uh, these preliminary tests are done with these model organisms, then you might see tests done with larger animals, um, whether that be rabbits. Um, I don't know why I can't think of other large animals that we conduct research on. Um, it's very rare that we conduct any research on, um, on apes anymore, um, but sometimes we do still have to if there's no other model organism that can can work, okay? Um, and then eventually when it comes to human um, trials, uh, after it's been shown to be safe in all of these uh, different model organisms, um, then you can start the process of, of human uh, medical trials. Okay, so hopefully this has helped you to understand a little bit about model organisms. I also have a little video clip I'm going to attempt to show you now. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever shown a video while using Zoom, <laughs> so we'll see how that works out. But um, I will post these slides and you can always use the link to watch the video as well. Um, there are going to be different advantages and disadvantages to each different model organism. But overall, uh, model organisms should be relatively easy to work with. They should reproduce relatively quickly. You should be able to have a kind of large population so that you can get um, good data, good statistics, um, and it should be posing little to no um, harm 
or basically you should be uh, very humane in the way that you treat your model organisms. And of course you want to choose a model organism that's going to give you the um, best similarity to humans for whatever specific thing you're testing. So um, that's going to vary depending on what the specific experiment is. Okay, so let's see if this works. Uh, da -da -da -da, open. Meet the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. This common kitchen pest is actually a powerful research tool for studying human health and disease. How can we learn more about humans by studying a fly? Well, it turns out that fruit flies and humans have a lot in common. About 60% of the genes in fruit flies are also found in humans, and two-thirds of genes involved in human cancers have counterparts in fruit flies. These similarities allow researchers to use fruit flies for experiments that would be impossible, unethical, or cost-prohibitive in people or other complex organisms. For example, researchers at the University of Michigan Life Sciences Institute are using fruit flies to better understand Down syndrome and to search for potential treatments. In Down syndrome, high levels of a protein called DSCAM leads to an overgrowth in the brain neurons, causing faulty connections. Researchers can recreate the same problem in flies by manipulating their genes. Bing Yi, a faculty member at the Life Sciences Institute, identified an existing cancer drug that could block the overgrowth of neurons in flies. Now further research is being done to see if this might be a safe, effective strategy for humans. And flies aren't the only model organisms advancing our understanding of human health. The same yeast that creates delicious bread and beer also holds clues about the function and malfunction of human cell processes. Many human conditions, ranging from neurodegeneration to cancer, result from the disruption of basic cell processes. Scientists can use yeast to manipulate genes and learn more about these fundamental aspects of biology. In Lois Weissman's lab at the Life Sciences Institute, researchers use yeast to work out how organelles within each cell get moved to the right location at precisely the right time. This work has the potential to shed new light on neurological disorders and other diseases. Understanding how the system is supposed to work is critical for understanding what happens when things go wrong. Yeast research earned Nobel Prizes in 2001, 2006, 2009, 2013, and 2016. And even millimeter-long transparent worms called C. elegans can help us understand more about how our bodies function and respond to disease. Despite its small nervous system, C. elegans can perform many behaviors that correspond to complex human behaviors. That's one reason why Life Sciences Institute faculty member Sean Zhu uses it to study the biology of our senses. For example, his lab showed that even though these tiny worms don't have eyes, they still respond to flashes of light. The researchers also discovered a new light receptor in the worms that's 50 times more efficient than the rhodopsin in the human eye. This new receptor could be used to help develop new research tools or even better sunscreen. So scientists don't study flies or yeast or roundworms to learn about these organisms, but to better understand the basic biological processes that shape health and disease. All right. So if that was hard for you to hear, you can rewatch that. And there's also closed captioning um, that you can use as well. Um, but hopefully that worked. Um, and also hopefully you, you realize the point of that video is not for you to memorize all the specific experiments that they talked about, but just the overall idea that we can use different model organisms to learn about how it might work in humans without having to run those tests on humans until we know it's safe or not we know, and we learn more about it. So we're not doing all this research on yeast and C. elegans and fruit flies because we're interested in yeast, C. elegans, and fruit flies, right? But we're interested in the application of what we can learn from those organisms and apply to humans. Sometimes we are interested in individual organisms, but usually we're interested in, in how it relates to humans. Okay, how's everyone doing so far? Any questions? Okay, so, 
The, um, another um, aspect of the simulation that you'll see is fluorescent microscopy, which is super cool. It's also, um, I used fluorescent microscopy in my research, so of course I'm going to be extra excited about it. And I included some really fantastic images. Uh, mine were not this interesting. <laughs> um, but you can use different fluorescent dyes, and each fluorescent dye is going to have its unique fluorophore, the molecule that actually gets excited and, and is emitting the color that you see. Um, but it's also uh, going to bind to a different region of, of the cell. And so in these images, you see two or more colors because they've used two or more, more different um, fluorophores um, or fluorescent dyes that bind to different regions. So in here, if you can see my pointer, you can see uh, the nucleus is, is showing up as blue. Um, some organelle that we don't know is this really bright green. Um, and it also looks like the cell membrane or cell wall, or maybe even cytoskeleton ha has been stained because we're seeing a a grid like regular pattern around the whole cell. It's probably the membrane. Um, and here you see red as well. And so I don't actually know what organism this is or what they were setting in particular, but a lot of times what happens is you find um, a specific organelle of interest and you follow it over the life cycle of the cell and you see how it what it's closely interacting with and how it changes over the life cycle of the cell um, and then you can also do tests to see um, if you are changing that um, those interactions and locations of the organelles um, and so here you're seeing an immune cell um, and this uh, is really neat because you're seeing the extension of the cell to move. And so if you're familiar with the immune system at all, you would know that we have phagocytic cells that are able to engulf, uh, whether it be debris or an invading bacteria or virus. Um, and so that's what's being shown here in this um, picture. And then over to the right, we have a cell that's being grown on a flat surface. And so um, that's why it looks so different than this plump cell that you see over here. And in fact, looking at this, uh, it, it looks like it's a paramecium, um, but I can't be sure. Okay, so um, do you need to memorize anything in these top images? No, they're examples and, and they're pretty. And I wanted you to think Oh, wow, how cool is fluorescent microscopy? You could pursue that as your research. Um, as you get into um, a four-year university, you could ask uh, different um, professors if you could do research in their lab um, and let them know what your interests are. Of course, read their research interests first <laughs> so you know if you're a match. Okay, so we can use fluorescent microscopy in a lot of different ways for a lot of different applications. And so one of those applications is to distinguish or differentiate between dead and living cells. Um, maybe you are going to test a chemical to see how safe it is and you expose cells to this chemical and then you want to see how many have died due to exposure to that chemical. And so you would want to see the ratio of living to dead cells. Um, there are a few different types of fluorescent dye that can do that. Some uh, fluorescent dye can easily diffuse into a living cell and maybe they would not be able to diffuse into the dead cell. Other, other fluorescent dyes will only be able to get into the dead cell. So depending on which dye you're using, you would know what you're looking at um, as far as if it's living or dead. In the lobster, I believe it's using the fluorescent dye that can only get inside of dead cells. Um, and so any fluorescence you see would represent a dead cell in that case. 
Um, I do have a little clip from Lapster. We'll watch that in a minute, but let's finish talking about this first. So um, I mentioned that the fluorophore is the molecule that you will um, get these pictures from. And different molecules will absorb different frequencies or wavelengths of light and then um, they'll emit and transmit different wavelengths. And so each different dye is going to have its own wavelength um, and that's how you get these different colors, okay? And so you would not choose two different blue dyes, but you would choose something far apart like blue, green, red, right? Um, and you would be hitting these with a very strong, usually ultraviolet light. Um, which is built into the fluorescent microscope itself. Um, and so you wouldn't see this, uh, you wouldn't see any fluorescence unless you were using an actual fluorescent microscope. It wouldn't work under a regular microscope. And now what else? We can also grow organisms, um, bacteria, yeast, or even the worms. Um, we can genetically modify them so that they produce their own fluorescent molecules, such as uh, green fluorescent protein. And those are called protein tags. So you're not actually adding a dye at that point. The organism itself will be producing it. We can also use antibodies, where you add an antibody that has a fluorescent molecule attached to it. And the antibody, anti, all antibodies are very specific. And so the advantage of this is that by adding the antibody, um, you're going to, uh, it's going to attach to a very specific region or very specific um, object. Okay, and then you'll be able to see that region or object by it lighting up. Okay, um, so fluorescent microscopy can be used to visualize microscopic processes um, or regions of the um, cell that are impossible to visualize with other microscopy, microscopy techniques. And I introduced that idea to you actually in the orientation video because I talked a little bit to you about my own research that I did using um, a dengue virus, which is a terrible human disease uh, transmitted by mosquitoes, and it can cause hemorrhagic disease, uh, which is, uh, you would know uh, Ebola is a hemorrhagic disease, so you know that's very serious, um, and viruses are too, too tiny to see under a microscope but I used a molecule with a fluorescent, a fluorophore attached to it that can bind to the virus's uh, genome and light up so that you could actually visualize if there were viruses in a sample. Um, so neat, that's an, another application of fluorescent microscopy. Okay, before we move on, any questions so far? Um, I have a question. Yeah. So um, you use that to basically see dead cells. That's like a virus because that's not a living cell, right? So we have a lot of different applications. And one of the applications is to be able to distinguish between living and dead cells. But my application, all of the cells were alive. Some of them had virus in them and some of them didn't. So it just depends on which specific assay or test you're talking about. So one of the tests that you'll be running in Labster will be uh, looking at live versus dead cells. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think this is uh, the last slide for the lab intro. Um, and this is talking about the kidney disease and specifically kidney disease that's caused by analgesic medications, any painkiller. So whether that be aspirin, um, acetaminophen, which is uh, the chemical name for the brand name Tylenol, so that you can have other products that have acetaminophen in them um, and you need to be very careful not to combine um, 
painkillers, especially if uh, if they both have the same ingredient, because then you can easily overdose. Um, caffeine, which we don't normally think of as a painkiller, um, but actually is helpful um, for some uh, anti-inflammatory uh, purposes. Uh, and then NSAIDs are, stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and this is like your ibuprofen. So a brand name of ibuprofen that you're all familiar with is probably Advil. Um, and so uh, any and all pain medication, if you use too much of it or you use the recommended dose for a very extended amount of time can damage your kidneys, okay? And so uh, that's one of the things you'll be looking at in the lobster simulation today. Um, I believe is you're going to look at, was there an epidemic of a infectious disease or was it um, the kidney disease due to um, overuse of uh, painkillers? And then um, some of the reasons why this uh, kidney damage can happen, maybe the medication has decreased the amount of blood flow to the kidney and then the kidney tissue starts to die. Um, or you could have repeated uh, damage, we call it oxidative damage. This is when the immune system is actually um, working to keep you safe, but in the process uh, damages, uh, while it's damaging bacteria, it also damages yourself. And if this happens uh, at too large of a scale, you can get enough damage uh, to your own tissue to, to cause disease. And so in this case, it would be happening in the kidney. Um, and this could even happen from having a consume, consumption of, of too many antioxidants. So this is um, kind of the easiest way to think of this is that if you were to take um, too many vitamins, right, where you have like your A, vitamin A and vitamin C, and your B vitamins. Um, different vitamins can act as antioxidants, um, which are good, but if you have them in very, very high doses, can actually then do damage. Um, and regardless of the specific reason for the kidney damage, the symptoms would be progressive chronic kidney failure, uh, detecting protein and or blood in the urine, um, having high blood pressure, and anemia. Okay, so someone might not have all of these symptoms, they might only have one or two. Um, and a small per percentage of all of these patients will end up having end-stage kidney disease, which means they will have to be put on dialysis uh, in order to clean the blood of all of the different um, toxins and waste that your kidneys normally do. Um, and then your kidneys normally put all that waste into urine and you get rid of it through your urine. If your kidneys are not functioning, then they cannot do that or they cannot do that effectively enough and all those toxins and waste build up in the blood and make you very ill. And so that's why you would need dialysis is to clean the blood uh, because the kidneys no longer can. Okay, so hopefully I've helped you to understand these different concepts. You will take your time, read through everything in the lobster simulation. Don't just try to click everything and get it done. <laughs> okay, take your time, do it right. And then hopefully that's the only time you need to do it.